Good morning. This session is called In Innovation Shadow. Here at this conference, and generally in the work that most of us do, we tend to celebrate innovation, to bank us, to bank on, get, on, us, on it getting us out of the messes we've created. We like to believe that technological innovation will propel society forward, and in many ways we've seen that it has. At the same time, it's undeniable that the benefits of innovation have not been universal, and it's critical to recognize innovation's potential for exclusion. Today I'll be speaking with photojournalist Reina Effendi and architect Mukena Makeka to discuss if and how innovation can be a driver for more inclusive societies. So to start off, I'd like to invite Reina Effendi to the stage. Reina is a social documentary photographer and award-winning photojournalist whose work is an eloquent testimony to human dignity and resilience. Reina was born in Azerbaijan, and her early work focuses on the oil industry's effects on people's lives. Reina has traveled the world documenting people and the places they live and work. And her work has been exhibited worldwide in some of the best-known galleries. Reina, welcome. Thank you. Hello, I'm...皆様、このようなニューテクノロジーの皆様方々の幕でお話しできて嬉しく思います。私は非常に古いメカニカルな機械を使っている一人だと思います。この仕事を守るためにロボットに捉えないように人間の怖さを持ちたいと言ってるのは皮肉なことはないでしょうか。私はこんなことです。非常に差別いた技術を使って写真を撮ってます。これシバリアで私です。マイナス35度でありまして非常
and the story gets out. On the National Geographic platform, with over 90 million subscribers, it gets instant social engagement in real time. So even though the camera I hold in my hands is twice my age, I use social media because it's uh, an amazing tool for storytelling. Now, I'd like to take you back to a place where it all started for me, Baku, Azerbaijan, where I was born and grew up. You may not know this, but the world's oil industry, which has been fueling our progress today, was also born here on the shores of the Caspian Sea, not too far away from where this fisherman is standing. The first oil well was drilled, and by the early 20th century, Azerbaijan generated half of the world's oil supply. We've been around oil for over 150 years now. It has shaped our societies, our economies, and unfortunately, it shaped our climate and environment as well. It's so central to our existence that we call it the blood of our civilization. But we've also seen its destructive powers. We've seen countries fall to the resource curse. So we know that it's as much a blessing as it is a curse. And we know that countries which rely on oil as a singular source of wealth have very dim prospects for a future. So here at this forum, we are all excited about innovation. We are talking about the new age, the technological age of all these amazing advances. And can we say that this new age will finally be post-petroleum? Can we scale back our demand for oil? Can we scale back the production and clean up the environmental mess we created? That's not a dream. It shouldn't be a dream. It should be a logical step. But unfortunately, we're still far from it now because with every new technological advance that renders petroleum obsolete, the growing developing economies make the de global demand for oil expand even further. Now, one of the first stories I worked on as a social documentary photographer portrayed the social impact of oil on my own city, Baku, that was undergoing a rampant urban transformation. These old historic neighborhoods were taken over by new construction, fueled by the oil demand and the demand for housing. And of course, it was the people who suffered. They were cheated out of their homes with inadequate compensations paid to them by businesses and corrupt authorities. They were pushed to the edges of the city. I met a man in this, one of such neighborhoods who invited me to his home to photograph his mother on her last day of life. I walked in and I heard this woman's heavy breathing. So I stood at the entrance, frozen, unable to move or do anything. I was with a friend, another photographer, and he whispered in my ear, 2.815, the aperture and the shutter speed of my camera manual setting. I took two frames and I left. The next day when I came back to give the picture to this man, there was a funeral tent outside his home, and his neighbors told me that his house was subject for demolition to make way for yet another faceless high-rise. This was when I decided to take this project beyond the limits of my city. And I followed a pipeline that took one million barrels of oil daily from the Caspian Sea into the Mediterranean. And as I traveled through these three countries, I realized that the steep curves of this pipeline don't make much economic sense. It would have been cheaper to build a straight line, right? But the pipeline skirted conflict zones and maneuvered its way through a very delicate web of political and social realities. It was important for me to document the human cost of this mega project that was meant for the greater good of the people, multi-billion dollar project. But in reality, it left many in the shadows of this great promise, literally underneath these people's feet. Every day, millions of dollars worth of oil was passing, and very little or none of that wealth trickled down to them. In Azerbaijan, I met Ilyas, a man who lived off his mother's elderly mother's pension of $50 a month in a village that has never had a gas supply. Underneath his courtyard, a pipeline ran taking hydrocarbons to Europe. 
this gas is not for us, it's for the West, people in this village told me. In Georgia, I met this family. They were displaced uh, because they lost their home in a landslide. So they resettled in the Black Sea port of Batumi, which was a very important oil transportation hub where also hospitality was a very lucrative business. Weeks after they resettled, their building was bought by private investors to be demolished and made into a new hotel. When I met them, they sat silently waiting while the bulldozers were tearing their home apart. They were evicted without compensation or any place to go. In Turkey, I met Mr. Alban. He was a farmer who lived two kilometers away from the pipeline, which ran underneath his farmland. He told me that the pipeline construction degraded his land, made it no longer arable, and his family lost their livelihood. Instead of compensation, he was offered a job at the pipeline company, which he took. But weeks later, he was fired because his boss was of a different ethnicity and a different religious background. Before the pipeline, I had my land, I had everything, he told me. Today, my roof is collapsing and I have no money to pay for it. Here, you're looking at the onshore oil fields of Baku. Some of the uh, world's wealthiest families in the 12th, 20th century, the Rothschilds, the Nobel brothers, made their first fortunes right here with this oil. Today, the oil has been depleted from these fields and the extraction moved outside into the sea, leaving these wastelands to be inhabited by the poor. So again, we're looking at the failed, at the picture of a failed promise of oil, right? Yet we still continue to use petroleum in almost every aspect of our daily lives. Here you're looking at people literally bathing in crude oil. There's an oil spa in Azerbaijan that offers medicinal petroleum baths to people, patients with arthritis and other illnesses. Now, I myself have never taken this bath, but this picture for me is a metaphor for the world's unhealthy economies that rely on oil as a singular remedy. With this in mind, I'd like to take you to a very different place. I was sent by the National Geographic to document the culture of haymaking in remote rural areas of Romania. They call themselves the last peasants of Europe, a dying breed of people who live off their land and still do most things by hand using the same agrarian tools from 500 years ago. I photographed this family. They ate and slept among haystacks, three generations of the same family working together to make hay. This man was stirring jam for eight hours straight with a wooden tool. If he stopped stirring for just one minute, the bottom of the pot would burn and an entire batch of jam would be ruined. So he just kept stirring. Today we look at manual labor as something negative, something we want to give to the machines, right? Automation. But maybe there was peace in this man's mind. The people I met there told me that working with their hands freed up space in their minds to have beautiful thoughts. The technology I've observed there that they use in everyday lives differed very little from the Middle Ages. Here you're looking at a medieval washing machine operated by a river stream that requires no electricity or fuel. The same gush of water where these women are throwing their blankets also jump starts a wool combing machine and a loom which is connected to a wooden crib with a baby in it. As mother weaves the blankets, the baby gets rocked to sleep. And of course, the entire ingenious system is also connected to an alcohol-making facility in the back, which distills plum fruit into brandy. I have observed young people there retaining their cultural identity. One of these young women may be clutching a smartphone in her hands, but she's dressed just the same way her great-grandmother was dressed going to a wedding or a special occasion. I was walking through the village one day there and I met a woman called Maria. She was sitting on the porch of her house. So I walked in and I said, hello, Maria, what are you doing? Nothing, she told me, just waiting for winter. Very slow pace of life, yet people didn't seem to be bored. They seemed happy and content. This agrarian community, however, is aging fast. Young people are leaving. They're lured by jobs in Western Europe and the elderly are dying out. 
And I think in today's fast pace of urban expansion, as cities swallow the countryside, communities such as this and cultures such as this are really on the brink of disappearance. The reason why I'm sharing these stories with you is not because I'm saying we should all abandon cities and move into the village and embrace our agrarian past, no. But as a photographer and a storyteller, my passion is to photograph places, people, and cultures before they vanish. This community managed to preserve their peaceful and sustainable way of life for centuries. These women created a harmonious cycle of codependency with their land and their animals. They will work very hard to make these haystacks, which they know by shape and size, and they will feed them to their animals in the winter, and the animals will feed them in return. They will produce milk and cheese, they will you know, plow their fields. So these women are fundamentally in touch with who they are and their place in life. As someone who documents the human condition, I pose a lot of questions with my work. What makes humanity so special? What makes us different? What sets us apart? I think as humans in general, we're very good at asking questions. That's how we grow and develop. And we're much better at asking questions than our synthetic prototypes, right? So today, we're faced with this one big question. What will be our place in a society that develops, where technology develops so rapidly it outpaces our own growth as human beings? If one day we wake up in a world where machines can do everything better than us, then how can we still be in touch with our own human identity and culture? And how can we adjust? Thank you. Thank you for sharing those powerful images and stories with us, Reina. Next, I'd like to welcome Makena Makeka to the stage. Uh, Makena is the creative director and managing director of Makeka Design Lab in South Africa. Makena's vision is to create a sound African aesthetic that serves the public and the client, bringing dignity and grace to the built environment. Makena has worked across Africa and has been recognized with many awards. In addition to the design lab, McCain is the founder of the Agave Spirit Company, which he'll tell us more about. He's also a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. McCain, welcome. Good morning, everybody. What's been amazing about being here at Tianjin has been this conversation about the fourth industrial revolution, leapfrogging new technologies and innovation for the world, as well as um, ourselves over here in this particular space. The image behind me um, illustrates one of the potentials of what these innovations can mean for us. So we have drone technology in Rwanda that's delivering medicine. We have other forms of innovation that's assisting with agricultural developments across the African continent. But the reality is that for many people on this planet, the fourth industrial revolution is interposed with the third industrial revolution as well as the second. And this is where the challenge of not being left behind becomes particularly important to us. Johnny Miller has taken some amazing uh, photography. He's based in Cape Town, and he's traveled to Mumbai, Lagos, South America. And what he begins to show us is the sort of intersection, if you will, between opportunity, between access to innovation, but close proximity to lack of access to opportunity. So rich and poor colliding, but sometimes separated by infrastructure, road reserves, and this is the interesting challenge that we face as a society today. Because within these condominiums, the internet of things becomes possible. The latest iPhone might be with people. There might be new smart technologies. But just adjacent and outside of these large condominiums, people are often dealing with fundamental issues such as sanitation, um, access to electricity, safe health care. So the reality is that we're dealing with a world where there is extreme inequality. And the innovations that we have right now, it is not automatically assumed that they will provide a difference to all sort of citizens. I come from a place in, in South Africa where inequality is quite extreme, um, quite problematic, with vast social and political implications. But having said that, it's important to maybe look towards the arts and towards creatives who have begun to imagine what can the cities of the future begin to look like. I've been involved in driverless car workshops where people imagined what the future would be. 
But I think the image on the right-hand side is probably much more useful. It's a Nigerian um, architect who does work. His name is Olale Kuhn Najeifu. And he talks about a future city, a future urbanism, which combines technology, past, present, and future. But it's a much more gritty reality. It's a city where transport, other forms of infrastructure need to be reimagined and reshaped. And it's about this juxtaposition of existing technologies with very basic needs on the ground. There's a whole discussion currently about the importance of smart cities, innovation centers, hubs developing across Africa, places where people are saying, if you put innovation here in this town, we can create new opportunities. But I think it's important to recognize that innovation is not a new thing. That in fact, if you look to our medieval past, there has been a history of ancient cities which were at the time sites of innovation, sites of metallurgy, sites of development. But there was a big difference whether you were inside the city or outside of it. So this question of inequality is not a new phenomenon, but it's actually a question about how do we as a species begin to make sure these opportunities are spread towards different generations and different communities. This is an image from 1923 where architects were beginning to imagine how do we deal with the question of urban infrastructure, buildings, highways, cities, movement of food and transport. These are not new debates, but there has been an integral sort of um, discussion about how do we begin to deal with these sort of issues from a design perspective? What is the aesthetic of these cities? And what does it mean to be a citizen in these types of places? Now, I'm particularly inspired by pop fiction, by art, by photography, uh, by graphic designers. And some of these images, I, I brought them together because I think they tell quite an interesting story. The one on the left-hand side is Janelle Monet. She's a, a, a musician, um, actor. Um, and the image in the middle is a poster from Fritz Lang's movie of Metropolis. And on the extreme right hand, an image of a comic book, uh, Black Panther, um, actually penned by Nnedi Okorafor, a Nigerian um, artist and science fiction writer. And what combines these sorts of imagery, a number of things, the notion that you can take the past, let's say Africa, project it into the future, the notion of robots, which is both not just about technology, but it's actually about this question about robota and slave and technology, the threat of the machine and what does the machine mean towards progress and development. But also on the last image, this question of culture and identity and how do we bring these things forward into our current realities. Now, some of you might be a fan of Marvel. I happen to be a sort of 70s generation, 80s kid, so I love my Marvel comics. But what I really liked, what, what Marvel has done in the last couple of years, has begun to intersect with this question of Afrofuturism and a reimagination and a proposition about what society could be. So Black Panther, which is quite close to my particular heart because my own culture for the first time was represented on the big screen, um, is quite important to me. But what was interesting about the discussion with some of the actors and the writers and the people there, they said they wanted to imagine what would civilization had been like if colonization had not happened. What would have the aesthetic of the city be, and what would it mean for integration? Is it possible to have different forms of innovation intersecting with different forms of reality? So these are some images from the movie which I find quite find interesting. The notion of an informal market that intersects with high technology. The notion that the aesthetic of a future city, similar to Alale Kun's work, is not just about the pretty and the glitzy and the modern, but that one can actually retain a sense of one's past. And I show these images because as we as a species move forward with all of the opportunities of the fourth industrial uh, revolution, there is a danger of forgetting our culture, forgetting our traditions, or believing that to move forward, we have to abandon our history. And I find these, these provocations quite interesting because they're artistic representations of how we cannot lose our culture as we progress, even if they're cartoons, even if they're just movies, but it's a site of the imagination. Now, I want to segue back to South Africa, where I'm from. South Africa, um, as you know, was um, freed from apartheid in 1994. It had a very, very uh, difficult period of, of not only colonization, but apartheid laws, where actually racial segregation was structured into the economy, structured into the legal system, structured into the urban framework. But I would also argue that many cities around the world have had this condition of separation, where there was access to technology, but not for all citizens. And I find this image quite interesting, caution, beware of natives, almost implying that native people are wild animals that one needs to be careful about. And just to make the point, South Africa is one of the most innovative and technologically advanced countries on the continent. And I think it's an interesting point to show that technology and economic and social progress are not necessarily always the same thing. 
the red circle on that side uh, over here next to me is actually highlighting a landmine. Um, when I was in my first year at University of Cape Town, the engineer burst into tears uh, and apologized to us because he said that he was involved in designing the landmines which have maimed thousands of people across the African continent. And he said that when he was taught about innovation, it was innovation for innovation's sake. It was about technology. There was no ethical proposition. There was no moral question. There was no debate about what was the impact of knowledge. It was purely about how do you make the most efficient landmine. And what was interesting about that moment for me as a designer and architect was that I realized that one cannot merely have innovation without an ethical or a moral agenda. Because what happens is that you create knowledge with, with no real purpose and can actually affect societies. So I left engineering, by the way, and decided to become an architect. And I took that lesson with me. And in the work that I did, particularly over here, we were involved in the preparations for South Africa with regards to the World Cup in 2010. There was extreme pressure on the continent to deliver a World Cup. Nobody believed it was possible. There was extreme pressure on us to create stadiums and to also to create, to create train stations, of which I was involved in. And the train station that I was involved in was a particularly interesting piece of infrastructure. It was celebrated in the 1960s as a shining example of apartheid architecture, how to separate races, how to control people. And there was a big demand for people to say that I must demolish this building, remove it because of its past. And I decided to take a very different route. I decided that we don't have the resources in these places to consistently rebuild all the time, to erase the past. I said, how do we reinterpret this infrastructure, a site that was associated with torture, associated with danger, with limited access, with uh, very problematic urban interfaces, I decided to create a new public square, a new place where people could interact, whether it be public art, whether it be public creativity. And it was about bringing innovation to the social dimension of how people occupy the city. And that revolution also happened in the inside. So we had a number of spaces where you can see a security official was about to stop me from taking a photo um, because we're not allowed to take photos inside public buildings. A very oppressive and difficult space. We transformed it into one of the most potent public spaces within the city. We had amazing celebrations there. Every year, 30, or 30, 30 to 40,000 people celebrate the new year in that particular condition. The image on the right-hand side was when we were connecting up towards the stadium. We had one of the most successful World Cups in history, as a matter of fact. And it was all because of how we reinterpreted this, this architectural edifice into social infrastructure. But it was also about the innovation of saying, how do we recreate and reimagine our cities to being more positive and integrated spaces? The city that I'm particularly from, Cape Town, is also known as being one of the most creative cities on the continent. We have a wealth of creative um, expertise in film, media, technology. You name it, we've got it. But at the same time, a lot of these technologies, people don't associate them with Africa, nor do Africans actually recognize that it actually belongs to them. So my proposition was to create a museum of design, um, innovation, leadership, and art. And I said I wanted to celebrate our creativity and bring it to the world. And people asked me, well, as an architect, what type of museum would you do for Africans? And what type of building would it look like? I decided to go back to the past. I was inspired by Egyptian hairstyles. I was inspired by hair braiding. And everybody said, but that's not architecture. But the point I was making is that one can be innovative in one's design process. I looked to the heavens, I looked to the stars, star constellations, which made a lot of sense in African mythology, but are not well known in Western culture. And I combined that to actually create a new type of contemporary building, where the windows and the glazing are inspired by African star constellations, where the form of the building is crystalline, where it almost doesn't look like a typical building. And people spoke to me and said, but we didn't think that this thing could be part of Africa. It looks like it belongs elsewhere in the world. I said, but why do you believe that an African expression needs to be of a particular form uh, which freezes ourselves in the past? On the contrary, we can be innovative in terms of the aesthetic of the future and what we need to, how we need to represent ourselves in the world. My next segue is a bit closer to home. My, my late father was the ambassador to the United States as well as to the United Nations at one point. And this is when he was actually meeting President Ford in 1976, uh, dressed in his uh, traditional blanket um, and traditional hat, which was also a bit of a new thing. It was quite an act of confidence to do that. Lesotho is one of the poorest countries in the world, and he was instrumental in terms of helping to unlock opportunities for the country from an infrastructure perspective. So whereas we might talk today about the Internet of Things, in many parts of the world, roads, sewage, electricity are the basic fundamentals of what is required. 
So he worked very hard, managed to get funding from Canada, the United States, and managed to bring roads into this very mountainous country. But there was a hidden cost that he hadn't anticipated at that time. These roads are largely responsible for an extreme amount of soil erosion, and Lesotho has a serious soil problem right now, where in fact, all of the arable soil is expected to disappear by the year 2040. The irony of the soil erosion is that it's also the place where a lot of the water which actually serves Johannesburg, probably Africa's economic powerhouse, actually comes from. So there's a strange contradiction between this poor mountainous country um, which actually produces water that powers um, Africa's probably largest financial center. And I find the contradiction between that access to technology and the poverty which it produces in its neighboring country quite an interesting juxtaposition. So what did I decide to do? I said, let me look at the agave plant, which actually grows in Lesotho and also grows in South America. People said to me, well, why are you trying to make your own version of tequila? You know, a bit like, and I said, it's not quite tequila because it's in Africa. But there was a time when the two continents to get, were together. So the plant species are actually quite related. And the beauty of this particular plant is its ability to hold soil and the ability to retain, retain nutrients. So I designed an estate. I designed a bottle on 89 hectares with a calculation we could save roughly 3 million kilograms of carbon, which allows us to access carbon trading. And we decided to take this plant and create new opportunities. And we said, what can the planet learn from one of the world's poorest countries? How can we leapfrog through our existing assets? And the plant is quite amazing because it has a number of, of attributes, a number of byproducts that can be created, uh, which are quite significant, ranging from rope making to paper to clothing and fabrics. We decided to, to design a whole range of byproducts that went with it, including a sort of agave estate. And here's a quick video, 20 seconds only. By the way, the song that was over there was produced by myself and a friend. I used to have a musical past, but that's a different discussion. Um, and the last two images I want to show you are really about why this work is important to me. You'll notice in my presentation I jumped from medieval times to this question of the future. These are my two children, and I'm obsessed with this question about what does the future hold for future generations? What does it mean to, to be a young child? What does it mean to imagine having grandchildren? And I think this question of inequality and innovation is not a nice term, but I think it's fundamental to the decisions that we make for today. And I end off with these slides over here where I'm quite proud of the fact that now my children are proud to wear a blanket, which was quite revolutionary in the year 1976 to go to the president wearing this blanket. And I think it speaks to a more diverse world a place where we don't have to abandon our identity moving forward, and that innovation is not just technology, but it's about how societies and people can interact. And with that, I thank you. All right, we have a few minutes um, left for q and I'm going to take the opportunity to ask a question of our two speakers first, and then turn it over to the audience. Um, so, Reina, to start with, as you look forward to the next 10 years, what are you most optimistic about and what are you most concerned about? <laughs> well, I think, kind of, to refer to your last slides, uh, I myself, as a, I'm a mother as well, so all of my anxieties and fears and all of my hopes and aspirations are connected with my daughter, and she's nine years old, and what future she's going to have. You know, and uh, the things that I fear the most is one of the biggest things is the environmental degradation that we're all witnessing today. Um, the thing that I am also excited about is, in a way, how technology can help us overcome these problems and how, I'll give you an example. My daughter asked me the other day, you know, I showed her a magazine, a National Geographic magazine, that was dedicated to the issue of plastic pollution in the oceans. And she was really affected by it. So she asked me, how many friends do you have? I said, you know, close ones, I have 10 and maybe 100, you know, more. She said, if you tell every single friend of yours not to use a plastic bag or a plastic water bottle, will this affect the ocean? You know, with this today's social media, we can really literally, you know, uh, 
yell out into the echo chambers and, and you know, discuss in the public sphere all these problems that we're facing. So I'm hoping that the next generation will grow up more aware and will be able to put their thoughts to action. Makeda, I'm going to ask you a different question. Okay. Um, what role do you see yourself playing as an architect and as a designer and an entrepreneur in ensuring that innovation can be a driver for more inclusive societies, especially in Africa? Well, it, it's, it's a very good question. I, I'll, I'll answer it by giving you a scenario where I was approached by some German um, innovators about a couple of years ago, and they wanted to sell their sustainable technology to, uh, to Africa, and they asked me to give them advice on it. And what was interesting is the first thing I asked them, I said, who's going to maintain this technology? So we'll, we'll fly some people from Germany to come down and sort it out. Then I said, well, that's, the fun, that's a fundamental problem because in terms of thinking of inclusive innovation, you have to make sure that the people using the technology have the ability to add on to it, to adapt to it. They're not just consumers of the innovation, but in fact, we want to see them as participants. And they change their whole um, strategy as opposed to saying, here's Africa as a market, but here's Africa as a market which we need to develop solutions with and for and to also see it as a site of R&D. And I think it's quite an important part of, of the conversation because if these places, and it's not just Africa, it could be the Global South, it could be, you know, it could be Indonesia, it could be Brazil. If we, if we think of, the, of these places as merely as markets for innovation, then I think that also produces inequalities and also a lack of respect for what you can learn on the ground. So I as a designer, uh, sorry about that, I as a designer, I'm quite intrigued about how do we integrate um, at the local level, global ideas, um, and make sure that there's, there's actual investment, if you will, um, social, cultural, practical, technological investment in these sort of innovations on the ground. Great, thank you. All right, I'll open it up to the audience. Um, questions that you have? All right, I'll ask another one. Um, Great, so Reina, how might we ensure that no community is left behind as we enter the fourth industrial revolution? What do, you, what do you think your role as a photographer could be and what do you think that we as a community could do? Well, I think, yeah, for sure the media plays uh, a role. You know, I'll give you an example. When I went to Turkey uh, photographing, you know, the course of the pipeline, I went to a village where 400 fishermen lost their livelihood because of the increased tanker traffic in the sea, they could no longer fish in these waters. And when they saw me, they said, you're the first journalist we're ever speaking to. Uh, you're the only one who is you know, here to tell our story. So definitely media plays a great role, but also I think governments and corporations should be more responsible uh, about their you know, corporate social responsibilities strategies you know, on the ground, because what I often see is, is a big disconnect between the dream and the, you know, the PR machine of, of, of the government and the corporations, which make a lot of great promises, but in reality, you know, these promises are not kept. You know, again, in the case of the, the oil pipeline that I followed, you know, they literally came to the villages and said, that's it, your life is gonna improve now because you have a pipeline underneath you that carries, at the time, a barrel of oil was $100. $100 million worth of oil every day. Mm. And nothing happened. <laughs> So there was all these expectations and hype and nothing came out of it. So that is the big question, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Okay, now what are your thoughts on this? How do we ensure that, I mean, you, you talked about sort of the opportunity not just view um, communities as consumers of innovation, but actually as producers of innovation. What are some, some of the ways that we can do that? Well, negotiation is something that's actually lacking uh, in terms of many of how these agreements are actually set up. So for example, there's a bit of a debate right now um, in Zambia and Uganda with regards to some of the deals that are being made with China around infrastructure development, particularly the terms of if, if a country defaults, what happens to those sort of sovereign resources? And the, the issue has been is that when those deals are being struck, you don't have uh, sort of uh, people on both sides of the table actually having good negotiation skills on these sorts of issues. So as much as I speak about making sure people on the ground have to have a role, it's important that decision makers equip themselves to be able to transact with these sorts of forces. Otherwise, they merely become recipients of aid or development in a sort of unquestioning fashion. 
and coming from South Africa, one of the things that we picked up most is that there is a lack of technocrat skills in forming the layer of government that's often engaged in these sort of bilateral and trilateral conversations. So you don't have enough engineers in the room, you don't have enough architects, you don't have enough town planners, you don't have enough agronomists. You have politicians often engaging um, in an asymmetrical conversation. And I think that's at the root cause of a lot of the problems of development on the continent and globally, because, because of the lack of um, uh, fair negotiation terms, if I could call it that. And it's a skill that actually has to be nurtured. It doesn't happen automatically to know what is happening when, when you're given a piece of paper and say, we will build you a dam, to understand what are the implications of that and how do you actually leverage a win-win situation for both parties. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that really speaks I'll, to I'll that. I'll add yeah. to that, yeah, because, you know, the governments, they look at the macro picture and often these details of reality on the ground get omitted completely with mega projects like this, you mm. know, and, and it's usually the, 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 the people who bear the brunt uh, yeah. of these costs, you know, they're, they're the human costs of, to these projects. Any questions? Yeah, please. This is a question to Rina. Um, you see the technology and internet has created such good opportunity and uh, convenience to us. For example, the technology this mm -hmm. conference is using. But at the same time, you show the picture of a traditional life. Mm -hmm. So you see these two scenes will go different direction or they, in the future they will integrate it with each, each other to create a better future. So the question is about is the technology going to benefit the traditional life or the traditional life is going to refuse to use the advanced technology? I think mm. that uh, there could be a bit of both. I'll give you an example once again from the stories that I worked on. I was uh, following this village in Azerbaijan. It was the highest populated point in the country, probably one of the highest populated points in Europe. And uh, it was a community of shepherds that spoke the language that no one else in the world spoke, a thousand of them. For 800 years, they didn't have a road. You couldn't get there. You had to go on special military jeep, uh, cross rivers and streams, and it was very hard to get there. So in 2006, the president decided to visit the village, and they built the road. <laughs> they built the road. It, in that place, they haven't had cell network, no internet. So life really changed. And I've been following this, this community for maybe 15 years now. And first time I went there was in 2002 when there was no road. I went there again this year. People had pictures on their walls, my pictures. And I said, how did you get them? They said, Instagram. <laughs> you know, there are young people who, who are carrying cell phones and they're getting bored and they don't want to stay in the village. They want to leave the homes uh, themselves. Uh, you know, it was a beautiful, it's, it's actually a UNESCO uh, heritage site, world heritage site. It was a very unique, architecturally very unique place. The way it was built into the mountaintop with every courtyard serving as a roof over the next uh, house. So people are now slapping tin roofs and antennas and whitewashing the walls. So the village is really losing its cultural identity. And life has improved for the people. They have better you know, living conditions, because it's easier for them, the road is there, it's easy to carry these construction materials, but we're losing, kind of, in a way, the culture of the place. So there's this pros and cons. And, um, and then another example that I was reading about, for instance, was in Bulgaria, uh, there were young, tech-savvy, young entrepreneurs who would get residencies, they called them, this program was called Residence Baba. Baba means grandma in Bulgarian. So they would, they would embed themselves in a grandmother's home and they would teach the grandmother how to use the internet and the grandmother would put her crafts online and sell them so the young people would help the, help the old people. So there are both ways and you know, there are ways for these, these things to work together and the, the new technology not to disrupt uh, the culture and the identity of places. We just need to be more aware of that, you know, especially in places of heritage. Thank you. So unfortunately, I think we're out of time. Um, I wanted to thank our speakers, and I hope that this conversation probably opened up more questions that we all have around considering topics of equity and inclusion in the face of technological innovation. So thank you both for joining us, and thank, thank you. you. Thank you.